Today's speaker is UW-Madison women's softball coach, Yvette Healy. She is in her seventh year with the program. And I really like her because she's a White Sox fan. <laughs> <laughs> Under Coach Healy's leadership, the program celebrates the highest winning percentage of any UW coach in the program's history. Prior to her collegiate coaching career, she worked for the Chicago Bulls, yes, and White Sox Academy as Director of Marketing. She served as head softball coach at her alma mater, Providence Catholic High School. Coach Healy, we look forward to your presentation and have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a thank you for speaking to us today. As we welcome her to the podium, please remember if time permits, we will have questions, but please wait for the microphones. I do have to admit, I am a Cubs fan. I'm sorry, Donna. I am from the south side of Chicago, but I am a Cubs fan. So one of my many um, things that I'll have to be admitting to today. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, this is exciting. Uh, you know, when you get invited to speak at things, and, and we often do as coaches, it's easy to say no because we're pretty busy. And um, then when you hear that it's going to be a big room, which some of my friends let me know uh, what, a, what a big crowd this would be, I, I thought of saying no once again. Um, you know, I was a little intimidated. And um, I did a little research and, and was reading about all of you. And when I heard about this 100 plus years of service from the downtown Madison Rotary and how this was one of the top 10 largest um, Rotary clubs in the world um, with having more than 500 members, I was so impressed and that I still wasn't convinced that I that I was going to do it. But, you know, selfishly, and I'll, I'll have to admit, as a coach, we we preach to our team a lot. And some of the things that we say to our team all the time are do things that scare you and get out of your comfort zone. So you guys got me. I had to, <laughs> I was nervous and I was scared to do it, but I said, you know, we're, I'll, I'll go for it. So feel free to continue eating. I'm used to, as a coach, you know, people show up and eat food while they're watching me work all the time. <laughs> they throw popcorn, they, it's just one of the weird things of, of what we do. But, um, you know, that do something that scares you is a, it's an interesting concept. And I think you'll, you'll hear that theme a couple times today and I'll bring it up. But, you know, we have catchphrases and little slogans that we do as sporting teams at Wisconsin. And you'll see different teams put something on their shirt, on the back of their shirt. I love your rotary slogan. You know, as I was researching and getting on the website, service over self, what a cool, I might have to steal that. If you guys see that, what a, what a great motto to go by of what's going to drive you. You know, when you think of what you want to do, what makes you nervous, what you can and can't do. And if you put service first, I'm sure that gets you out of bed and that forces you out of your comfort zone and gets you to do so many things that you wouldn't do normally because it's not about you, it's about that service. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that concept. I put up on the screen a couple of the um, t-shirt sayings that we've had over the years. And this past season, we had Believe It on the back of our shirts. So it was neat. We went into the season. I was trying to talk the team into believing that we could be great. We could be in the postseason. We could be on ESPN and playing at the end of the year. And when we made it to the NCAA tournament and we were beating Missouri on, on ESPN on a Friday night game, believe it looked so good on the t-shirt. I was like, that's great. This is what I had envisioned. Now the first one, one of my first years, I was just trying to talk the team into like buying in and, and going for it and trying something new. So the first year that I took over and this will be my eighth season. So that was seven years ago. I put just say yes on the back of all their t-shirts and I didn't think through the implications that <laughs> the, the girls were not happy with, with Coach Healy as people were yelling across campus to the softball team, just say yes on the back of their shirt. So hopefully my slogans have gotten a little better through the years. Um, but if you happen to see one of those and in the old Adidas stuff, you'll know that was my first season. <laughs> And things have moved along. So to today's goal, I figured I would share with you a couple sports stories. I think it's kind of fun that, you know, you guys are around athletics. We're in Madison. There's sports everywhere. So I'll share with you just a couple stories of what's going on over at the university, um, some of the things going on in the sporting world, and then just share some ideas of what's happening in leadership and motivation. Um, I think it's fun to be current on what are people reading, what are they talking about, what themes are going on. So I'll share with you and then hopefully answer some of your questions and, and not go over time. Donna's got an eye on me. She's going to have it there. 
So one of my jobs I think of here at UW, what my job is, I'm kind of in charge of the inspiration for the program. You know, you think of coaching and you think of X's and O's, and I'm here to teach them how to hit and how to field and, you know, how to be a great program and win games. But I think more so than anything else, when you take over a program, and for me, I took over a program that had been struggling. Usually coaches are new because someone won a lot and they went on to something bigger and better, but it's not much bigger and better than the Big Ten and Madison. And you're, this is kind of one of the top programs, um, sporting programs in the country. Um, or you're struggling. So um, when I took over at Wisconsin and I was looking at the job, we were ranked about 188th in the country. And so softball is like basketball. If you're familiar with the RPI, they rank all the teams. There's 300 softball teams, and we were close to being ranked 200. So that is a little, a little bit scary. A lot of people walked away and, and didn't think that this was a good job. And they said, oh, well, it's a warm weather sport. It's a cold weather state. It's going to be rough. There's a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of challenges. Things haven't been good. I've always been one of those people that kind of saw the challenges as opportunities. You know, and anybody could spin things the way that they want. I did work in PR, as, as Donna had said. That was my, you know, my gift. You just turn it and make it sound better. Um, <laughs> but I thought so myself. I thought, why wouldn't they be good? I mean, I know it's cold in Wisconsin. I was from Chicago. How much colder could it be? It's it's kind of the same, honestly. People say it's colder. I don't think it is. Um, but, you know, I saw it as an opportunity. What a cool thing to go someplace that hasn't really been on the map for this sport and, and go in there. And so I just thought of how do we change the culture? You know, I didn't focus on we can't hit, we can't field, we can't pitch. <laughs> I, I was just, I called them coach. <laughs> Those are minor. Honestly, my biggest worry going into it, I had a two-year-old at the time, I had a husband, so I was going to uproot my husband and his job, and he was coaching high school basketball and running his own company, uproot him, uproot our then two-year-old daughter, Grace, move up here, take over a flailing program that hasn't won, not worried, not worried. When I thought about we were lifelong Bears fans, moving into Packer Nation, that made me nervous. That made me nervous. I knew how bad we were at the time, and I knew what our quarterback situation looked like, and I was right. I was up for years of being ribbed as a, you know, lovable loser Bears fan, but but I did, that, that was the part that worried me. But the rest of it, I just thought, wow, think of what could be here. Um, so, you know, as you take on these big challenges and you look at what your opportunity is, I saw this as something cool, as, you know, a kind of an untapped into an, a, a diamond in the rough. Um, and when you take on these things, one thing that we say to our team, and I put the quote up there, is just know your why. If you have a big enough why, if there's a big enough reason driving you, you're going to find a way how. And we say that to our team all the time. And, you know, especially when something's going wrong. Well, well, what's driving you? Why are you getting up? Why are you working out? Why are you putting in all this extra time? And I'm sure I'm sitting in a room with a lot of people with very strong whys that you really are very in tune with what you are trying to do in life and what you're trying to accomplish. So I'm sure this is tough for all of you to get here for lunchtime. And you're rushing around and you're busy and you're doing all of this, but your why must be that strong that you can uh, take time out of your schedule and probably make this day a lot longer than your normal Wednesday uh, to try to do something that's very important to you. So for me, my big why and why I got into coaching is just the word empower. Um, you know, in sports, my crash course for sports for all of you, that if you've been around it or if you haven't been around it, uh, there's a lot of money and there's a lot of men. That would be my take on sports. And, and that's, that's the truth. I know I'm a woman who's grown up playing sports my whole life, but if you work at a BCS school like Wisconsin and there's football and there's basketball and there's hockey, there's big money. We've got facilities, you've got you know, contracts with Under Armour, you've got football, you've got all these things going on. And with that comes, you've got to win. You know, they give you these things and all eyes are on you and there's contracts and stuff and there's that side. And you're surrounded by a lot of, of men. And growing up playing the sport, I was coached by a lot of men. Thank goodness I had some awesome coaches. I'm still very close to my high school coach, Dick Mandela, who was at my wedding, and my college coach, Eugene Lenti, who was one of my mentors. Um, but I didn't have a lot of strong female role models. There just weren't a lot of women in coaching. And now as coaching's gotten to be a little more lucrative and it's actually a, a great job, I get a lot of people that say, oh, you coach, so what else do you do? <laughs> what do you do all the other days when there's not a game? I'm like, it, it is a full-time job and this is a pretty good one in the world of it. Um, but when I got into it, I just thought, this is my thing. I wish there were more female role models. I really wish there were more women doing these things. And for us at um, Wisconsin, we've got 24 sports and there's four female head coaches. 
So we're a small number already. And then if you add into the mix that we moved here with the, I, my husband, I had a two-year-old, there weren't a lot of moms, working moms, all of that. So I've gotten into it. I don't uh, think I'm the best coach in the world, but I think it's important that I'm kind of carrying that flag and, and doing it. And so now, seven years later, we've got a nine-year-old. Gracie's grown up from two to nine. And we had a little daughter, Maeve, um, while we were here who just turned five and is going to be going to kindergarten. So it's fun to see that it's been working out for us. Um, some things that I wanted to share with you. I'm a big book person. I think if you get um, with coaches, there's a lot of cool, inspirational, great reads out there. Here's some of the things that we're doing with our team. I know you guys had Coach Chris here um, a couple of weeks ago. Paul uh, does such a good job. He could not be more humble. I actually, I'm, I just want to be around him all the time because I'm like, is he for real? Is he really? I'm just waiting for him to not be humble at some point. It will not happen. He really wears like the crew neck sweatshirts all the time. And, you know, if we had a coach's retreat at the end of the spring and he was like, hi, Vet, what do you think? How's the team looking? And I was like, hey, thanks for caring, Paul. <laughs> Thank you guys for caring. Thanks for having me. Um, so Paul read with his, t uh, his team that first book, The Traveler's Gift. Um, and he read it last year, and I had a couple people share this book with me. So we wound up doing that book last year with our team, which was really kind of a cool read of just how do you look at life? How do you look at your opportunities? How are you approaching your daily activities? Are you complaining? Is it too hard? Do you see where everything's going to stop, or do you see your opportunities to move forward. Um, and those are some other books on there that we've done with our team or that we've been reading that I think are, are kind of cool. So from The Traveler's Gift, I just wanted to share with you a little bit one of the characters that I related to and that we talked to our team. We read the book. There's a bunch of characters in the book that they kind of each teach them a lesson. And I'm amazed at our team. There were days that they got more out of our chalk talks and our book discussions about approaching the game better than the cage sessions, you know, than us hitting ground balls and fly balls. And I think all of us sometimes get so wrapped up in what needs to get done that we don't take a step back and think, can we help make our teams and our groups better? Could we get people more enthusiastic, more tapped in, more excited and engaged? You actually might get more out of it than just pushing your agenda all the time. So for me, my agenda is obviously hitting home runs, <laughs> striking people out. But I had to take a step back and think, well, how do I just get my team to um, be fearless and do these things? So one of the characters I really liked, Chamberlain, was kind of, an, and these are all based on um, true people in life, so you can kind of read up on Joshua Chamberlain a little bit from the Civil War if you're interested, but um, kind of a cool story of a, you know, a reluctant leader, a school teacher that was drawn into service and needed um, just because there was a need to do something. And his big, um, his big motivating factor was just take action. It's going to be hard and you might fail. You've got to go for it. And working with young women, this is a big thing for me. I think we are around some people that are, they're so great and they're so brilliant and they're so successful. I'm sure you know some young women like that in your life. They might be daughters, granddaughters, sisters, nieces, uh, wives. They're so, they have so much to offer, but they're scared to mess up and they don't want to take something on that they could fail. And I'm always like, Come on, let's mess up big. Let's. And so he had, um, you know, his quote of, you know, just taking action and going for it. And he was saying, you know, this one thing I can do, I can persist. And I think we can all kind of agree with that, that, you know, we can mess up a lot of times, but we can all get out of bed the next day. You know, we can always uh, find a way to carry on. I'm, I'm trying to get back into running a little myself. And there's mornings where I'm like, all right, I don't know if it's going to be a good run, but I can, I can put one foot in front of the other. So I'm trying to pick my book for this year. If you guys, if anybody has some good ideas, I'm open. I'm sure you can get our contact information through the Rotary. Feel free to forward them along. But um, the one book that I've picked up this summer that I'm about halfway into is called Chase the Lion. And it's kind of a cool idea of, you know, the tagline on the front is like, if your dream's not big enough, if it doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. And there's all these things going on about, you know, you, if, if you think of a lion, if you run into a lion, apparently, I mean, I'm from Chicago, so I, there weren't many lions. I'm, I'm a that there's turkeys up here, wild turkeys that aren't alcohol. Um, so if you run into a lion, apparently, and you run, it will chase you and kill you. It will if you run. And the, the point was, the story kind of begins of if you go towards it, if you run towards danger, you actually have a better chance of survival. If you face those fears and are on the aggressor, you actually might survive. I, I hope I do not find that out. But there's kind of some cool things in that. And just saying, too, that you really should have a, a dream or a goal in your life that's that big that you cannot do it alone. 
And, you know, it should be such a big dream that you need the help of others. And there's a, um, quite a significant religious uh, undertones and implications, too, that, that talk about that side. But saying, do you have a dream that you need help? And when I see all of you in the community that you have, I can't believe you meet once a week. Like, I'm, that's pretty amazing. I'm a part of groups. We can't make anything happen. We have a mom's club. It's like... Luis is part of it. We barely can get together once every couple months. So to do it once a week is amazing. Um, but that community side, I think it is big for all of us. And if you're trying to accomplish something, I look to all of you to say my goal at Wisconsin is to for softball to win a regional, to go to the NCAA tournament, to win the Big Ten, to go to the World Series. I know we can't do it on our own. So selfishly, I'm here today to get all of you involved. And at least I have a couple more fans, whether you come out to watch us play or whether you watch on TV, but it really does take that community. Um, so back to my job of, you know, what softball looks like in my world. So I've, I've tied my livelihood to the decision making of 18 year olds. Uh, I, you know, whether I keep working here, I don't know if you know any 18 year olds or 18 to 22 year olds. And uh, my livelihood is based on them making good decisions. And, um, but, but I think it's great. It's a risk. It's fun. Um, but I, my job every fall is to take that fresh crop of freshmen and get them to fail brilliantly, get them to take risks, because the more overachieving they are, the more cautious they are, the more uh, perfect they want to be in. I'm sure, has anybody this summer been at any Little League games? Anybody been in the stands at any Little League games? I have a five-year-old that's playing, and I have a nine-year-old. There's a lot of this. Put your elbow up. Swing. Don't swing. Don't Wait for a good pitch. Wait. Don't, don't be patient. And then the ball comes, and there's this poor little kid. And the catcher catches it at strike three and they're just freeze. And I'm like, oh, just swing, just go for it. So we've all been in that world of, you know, paralysis by analysis where you're kind of are thinking so much that you can't do. And, you know, I every fall and that'll be my job when all these new freshmen come in, get them to go for it a little bit, get them to take chances. Um, I read the book with a couple coaches in um, in our industry, Lean In, and Cheryl Sandberg did a, you know, she's a CEO of Facebook and had a whole thing on her wall. She said that done is better than perfect. And I was like, oh, that just hurts me to hear that. I like love writing and editing and like, no, do it and do it perfectly. That's, that's what we're here for. And it kind of made me think of, well, yes, but if you had to choose, sometimes in the doing, in the messing up, in the uh, struggling, you actually are making more strides. So I've tried to I've tried to adopt that a little bit more. It's tough for me. But this fear of failure of trying to get over what is hard and take chances. My first day of practice at Wisconsin, the thing that we did our whole first day of softball practice was just teach them how to dive. Teach them how to dive. That was it. I was like, I don't know if we'll catch it, but we're going to be on the ground. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be in our glove, but people will cheer because we're going to give a lot of effort and do that thing. <laughs> it's true. And, you know, it, Coach Alvarez also told me, he said, your team looks more like the linebackers than our offensive line. And I was like, oh, okay, well, we got to get in shape. We got to get in shape and we've got to learn how to dive. So we had to, <laughs> we had to give a little bit of effort, but, um, but teaching our team that it's okay to go for it and miss was, was a big thing. So um, that's something that I... I've pushed into and kind of tried to ingrain and it's made quite a difference. So, you know, if you are around young women, um, especially at that age, you know, instead of us constantly just praising people for their accomplishments, how about for the approach? How about for, you know, being in it for a, a worthy battle? And for me, that was one driving factor to coming to Madison. I knew how hard it would be to make the softball team good. I mean, you know, you were taking kids from California and Arizona and Texas and we're bringing them up and we're like, so do you ice fish? <laughs> 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 but getting him to go into it, but I really been a fan of, I remember having to, you know, interview for a, a scholarship when I was younger and they said, who's an influential figure from a book? And I was like, oh, but I remembered Atticus Finch um, from To Kill a Mockingbird just taking on a case that he found maybe not winnable, but worthy, you know, and for all of us of, can you look to things in your life that you might not be able to tackle? You might not be able to solve. You might not be able to win, but should there be a dog in the fight? And, you know, hence I'm here today. I said, I don't know if I'm going to do a good job, but I can, I can show up to the fight and be in it and be in that worthy battle. So um, one of my favorite, you knew you'd get some good quotes, you know, having us sports people, we're all such cliches, I know. But one of my favorite quotes that we use this year is it's not the best team. It's not the best team that wins. It's the team that plays the best. 
And people are like, what do you mean? And our team, coach, what do you mean? I'm like, just so you know, we're not the best team. <laughs> when we were playing Missouri and they're an SEC team, we're not on paper, we're not the best team, but we have the ability to play better than them on any given day. And that fun side of saying, you know, you really don't have to be the best at anything, but that action of getting in and going for it and having a chance to perform is kind of, I mean, to me, that's kind of the invigorating part. So when I woke up at four in the morning this morning, a little nervous, I was like, man, I mean, how many times do you do anything that actually makes your heart beat a little bit? That does make you nervous. That scares you. And do you run from those things or do you go towards them? Um, one of the, the other books that I wanted to tell you guys about, just to give you something to reflect on, because I know I'm in a, a room of a lot of leaders and some very brilliant minds. We read this team as a, um, a coach's study. It's called Inside Out Coaching. And it's kind of a really interesting idea of how are you approaching what you do. And I think as a parent, as a coach, as a grandparent, as a leader, as a um, boss, there are things to think about. Why do you do this? What, um, why do you coach the way you do? Uh, what does it feel like to be coached by you? And then finally, uh, how do I define success? And um, not to spoil the book, there's no spoiler alert, but kind of the idea is just that by default, we will all parent and coach and be a boss the way that we were parented or coached or the way that we were led. That's what we all default to, which is kind of scary when you think about some of your family things. I love my mom dearly, but there's some crazy stuff in the Healy house growing up. Um, but why do you do it the way you do? Why are you a yeller? Why do you lose your temper? Why are you, you know, why are you the way? Well, that's kind of how you were, how you were raised. And it really takes a level of sophistication for us to all take a step back and say, maybe I don't want to do everything that way. Maybe this was great and I had some great people, but maybe I want things a little bit more for my kids. I want to, I want to have a little more patience. I want to do things a little bit better. And as a coach, I'm lucky that I've had the longevity to do this a little bit. I was a coach at Loyola before coming to Wisconsin. So now, you know, 14 years into being a head coach, I can reflect and not just say, this is how I do it. I do it this way because this is how I do it. But saying, is this how I would like to do it? What does it feel like for someone to be there as I'm John Adam? When I call time out and it's on TV and people are eating their popcorn and everybody's taller than me, so I'm like, what are you thinking? Why'd you put the ball there? Why you know, and I, I call my timeouts and then I'm thinking, actually, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters how she feels in that moment. How can I put her in the best position to be successful on that side? And um, this reflection has really kind of helped me be a better coach. The more I've made it less about me, the more I've made it about them and how they feel and getting them to be in a good place and get to their peak performance. It's amazing um, the, the things that you can see happen. So, um, I think of all those things, how my staff feels, how my team feels. And I think we've been really successful that way. It's fun for me because, again, I don't think everyone does it the same way as me. And I was driven to say, maybe we don't all have to be jerks in coaching. <laughs> Call me crazy. You know, maybe everyone doesn't have to look the same and act the same and do the same thing. We don't all have to. And we can think that too. If any of you are at your little league games this summer and you're in the stands and you hear someone yelling, she's terrible. Just hit the ball. This ump, you know, and we all fall into these things of everyone just goes along. Why? I think we're in a room of leaders here. Can't we envision a better future? Can't we think of, of how it can look better? So um, that side of it, of what it feels like, I think as leaders, we can take a step back and do better. Um, and this quote just kind of gives a nice little idea of like, really, people aren't going to remember what you said. I'm sure today you guys will not remember, but they'll remember how it made you feel. And I hope, you know, there's a little bit of a smile or a little bit of empowerment or a little, there's more things possible in life. I mean, heck, I'm from the south suburbs of Chicago and my dad was a car salesman and no one had gone to college on his side of the family. And, you know, I can't believe I'm here today. I can't believe I'm living in Madison and, and working at UW. But when you see good stories and you can share them, it's amazing how you can lift other people up to what the possibility possibilities are out there. Um, the last kind of slide I have for you here, um, I do get a lot of like emails and texts and I, I try to stay current on what's going on in the world of inspiration. So that same author, Andy Andrews, this came across my phone this morning, um, had a, a cool story and he was talking about um, three inspirational words and this will be your food for thought as you go home, that you can think about how these three words could be inspirational in your life and in the people that you are going to touch. And are you using those ones? And the first one's yet. 
And I think that's such a cool, powerful word because people say to me all the time, oh, Wisconsin softball, have you guys been to the World Series? I just say, not yet. <laughs> Instead of just no, I mean, that's terrible. But we say that and think of, you know, when you do have a big goal, well, it just hasn't happened yet. But it opens the world to maybe someday working towards it. I'm, I'm making it long, and I think that's kind of fun. Uh, proud, if you're not using that word with the people in your life, I mean, I'm just going to say to all of you, I'm proud to be standing here looking out at a group that does this much for Madison and the, you know, the greater good of the whole state. So give yourselves a round of applause for a second. I think that's part of my job is to look for and affirm when people are doing things right in coaching. Some people just say what you're doing wrong. And I literally try to reprogram my mind and not tell them when the backhand's wrong, but watch the one time that they hit the front of the base or drive through a ball or run something down. So that word of proud of I'm proud and I'm going to look for the good and actually try to call it out is so important. And then the final one, imagine, you know, are we spending enough time in our day thinking about what things could be? how good they could be, what life could be like, what the world could be like. And I'm sure I'm in a room of a bunch of dreamers and people that are imagining, because you must be. You wouldn't be taking your time and your talent and your finances unless you were imagining that side of it. Um, from my world, thank you for making my job easier. I love Madison and you've all made it a really nice town. I love recruiting to this town and it's so easy when it is such a wonderful thriving community. So thank you for that side. And lastly, thanks for being part of um, the university, the athletics department and the softball team's success. When you make the, the city better, when you do things to make Madison a better place to live, a better place to show up every day, it makes people want to be a part of this. And I think when we bring people in, they're amazed at how kind and outgoing and giving people are. So thank you for being part of our success. If we win the Big Ten, we host the tournament this year. It's like once every 12 years, but the Big Ten softball tournament will be in Madison. If we win and we jump in the lake afterwards, you guys can all come jump in the lake with us too. <laughs> But thank you guys for being a part of it. I appreciate it. Okay. Oh, thank you. Any questions? How'd I do, Don? Am I on time? Whoever mm -hmm. gets the mic. Thank you for being here today. Great inspiration. Thank you. Women's hockey, women's uh, softball and uh, women's volleyball. You don't get enough attention from the press. When will we trip that trigger where women's sports, given the high quality of performance that we see here and around the country, might get their just due oh. in the media? Well, thank you. I appreciate the compliment. Um, you know, it, it is getting better. I don't think it's perfect, but we've had a ton of games on ESPN and the Big Ten Network. So from a visibility standpoint, it's fun that it's we're getting more visibility. One of our girls, Kelly Welsh, is from South Bend, Indiana. She made Sports Center top top ten plays when we were in the NCAA tournament and, and robbed a home run in center field. So I see it getting better. Hopefully, we're making strides. But man, if I had the answer, I'd be a, a rich woman. <laughs> My, my name is Nancy Young. Uh, thank you for being here. And you make it sound very easy what you teach your kids. And you said you were so nervous coming here, but you have it all so well put together. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And could you make available to us the book list um, so that we could print it out and have copies? Would that work out OK? Absolutely. I know my whole file is here on the Rotary uh, laptop, right. so they have that. And I can always email another version, too. But I can do that. Good. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you very much for joining us, Coach. If I could indulge two questions. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> one, don't what, know is, one, what is your standard uh, pitch to a recruit for Madison? And number two, uh, has uh, data analytics come to college softball to the extent it has in other uh, baseball, softball leagues? Yes. Well, the standard pitch, when you said pitch, I was like, rise ball? Um, no. For, for getting kids to come here, we really focus on fit, much like you would hear football and basketball talk about fit, that we aren't getting the biggest, highest blue chip recruit, but we get some kids that are just great 
family, hardworking, blue collar, you know, get after it kind of kids that get better. So if we get kids that fit and buy in and are academically minded, which has made us, since I've come to Wisconsin, we've recruited the Midwest and Wisconsin far more. I think sometimes, you, you know, you can't, you, you have to envision how good they're going to be because they're not facing the same talent. But we are all about fit of if they're a Wisconsin kind of kid. And analytics is a huge part of it. So if you've seen the movie Moneyball, if you've read the book Moneyball, if you look at just stats and trends and all of that stuff. I'm a, I'm a big Joe Madden fan, and he's got some really cool podcasts just on the analytics of the game. But he makes a great point of you can't overanalyze, and you have to leave a little room for the heart side of it. And I believe that as someone who grew up in the you know Chicago Catholic school system, that the nuns used to say, leave a little room for the Holy Spirit when you're dancing. <laughs> so you didn't dance too close. But I think you've got to do that. Leave a little room for that when you're making decisions that it's not all paper. It's not all X's and O's that you have to leave a little room for some of that divine intervention, but also, you know, don't underestimate how someone's heart factors into it. Yes. Hi. Could you talk about whether you have any formal ways of organizing mentorship within the team for the older students to the new ones? Okay, um, mentoring, we do a big sister, little sister, big sister program. So when they come in, we pair them up with big sisters and little sisters, and those big sisters help them get their books and walk them around campus, so they've got that. But we do a lot of things like reading books together, chalk talks, letting them present. I mean, my goal is to put them on stage as much as I can. So I get the, the team involved in activities where they have to discuss conflict management right then and there. So we'll go through role playing. Kelly Sheffield from volleyball shared this with me. They do like charades and they pull up something that says, your teammate's late for lifting. Ready? How are you going to address this? And then you make them come up and act it out because conflict is so uncomfortable for so many people. So we do try to give them opportunities to lead. And then I would say our best mentoring is community service. So we are highly involved in going to the hospital as a team and you know going to the Ronald McDonald House because I see them leading and mentoring and getting connected by doing um, you know work in the community. And for me too, then I get to know them off the field, which is great. Hi, thank you. Great Hi. program. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, I wonder what the economic impact to Madison is of the softball program or of the women's athletics. Uh, the community is putting a lot in, which is wonderful. Great to see the girls uh, doing so well, or young women, I should respectfully say. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering what the community is getting back from it. Thanks. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, as someone who's in athletics, I think I've heard athletics described as the front porch to the university many times. And I fully believe that side of, you know, when you see your athletics department, it's almost like the friendly interface that people feel like they're part of a university because they get to know the athletes, they get to know that side of it. So um, being representatives in the community, I think goes pretty far of having games on the Big Ten Network and, you know, having games on TV. Um, our student athletes are really involved in the community too that they're, they're seen as leaders and role models. So they're out, you know, booking it with Bucky and reading to kids in the, in the, the schools or going to um, retirement homes and singing and playing bingo. So I think be, they've been great ambassadors um, for the university, just kind of reaching out and trying to connect so that they're a face and a, you know, people recognize the W and they recognize when you're wearing your red. And if I go pick up an ice cream cone for my kids at Dairy Queen, people say, good game coach. And I think that side of being a face that they can connect to a bigger university is sometimes a, a cool thing. I don't know the actual financials behind it, but I would say from a leadership development standpoint, you know, athletics are such a huge part, especially for young women, of helping them be great leaders and, and go into jobs and be confident and move forward. So I, I would do it even if none of the money was surrounding all of it. I don't know if my husband would agree, but, um, but I think just from that standpoint of we are developing young leaders, and it's such a cool thing then to see them move forward with what they learn from sports of just being able to walk into a room when they're nervous and shake someone's hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, I was doing sports about 50 years ago in high school and um, none of my sports was involved with doing presentations or reading books. <laughs> is, is this something that's become state of the art in the last 50 years? Or? <laughs> 
to think of myself as a uh, trendsetter. No, um, you, you know, you can read on who your favorite. I, you know, I read a lot on Pete Carroll, who, you know, obviously once we had Russell Wilson here and then he made the move to the Seahawks. Um, he's pretty progressive and you can read some things if you just Google and, and look at what he's doing and how he approaches it. But in sports, you're hearing a lot more about it being character driven instead of just focusing on the X's and O's and physically what they can do. If we can help them have a better temperament and approach, and, and you'll hear it in the military a lot now too, that how they're training has, they're adding this um, mental grittiness, toughness, being able to cope with things mentally um, over just let's lift weights and run. Because when it hits the fan, you know, you need to have the right approach to, oh my goodness, someone's coming after me and how we respond. So I think you're hearing so much more mental across the board in sports and, um, and performance and um, combat. And I think it's really useful because it is that, you know, that mental approach that's going to get you through more so than just, can you hit it? Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Healy. That was very in, uh, inspirational. And I don't know what your takeaway was, but my takeaway is leave room for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thank you, and we are adjourned. Thank you.